Dictator or Darling? Hmm, I wonder which. I understand the subject matter about being submissive and woo, as much as I love Paul and I think Paul's brilliant how much that New Testament he wrote, but sometimes he wrote things that are very, very hard. And then sometimes right next to it is a verse not so hard. For instance, the ones about family in Ephesians and Galatians it says, um, and husbands, love your wives. Woo, I love that verse. That's like one of my favorite verses of all time. If I could have that one tattooed on my hand and hold it up to my man seven times a day. Love me. Love me. The Bible tells you so. I love that verse. Woo. Paul wrote a good one there. It's that very next one that gives me fits. The one that says, and wives, submit to your man. It's hard to even bring myself to say it. And when I was young, it was easy. It was easy to submit to him because I was young and thin and he's tall and handsome. I would look at him and think, you're so big, you're so strong, you're my man. I love you so much. Just tell a girl what to do. I got older and gained weight and I got to be honest and tell you, it's hard for me to submit to him now because basically I think I can take him. Well, Anita is absolutely right. We are going to look at yet another S word. Last week we looked at the little S word. Now we're going to look at the big S word and that is submission. I've told you a little bit about my past. Well, Beloved and I had been married about uh, just about 10 years when we hit a wall. And we hit that wall because we really had no idea how to be married. And although we started off great, we ended up in a horrible place. He was very much unhappy. I was even more unhappy. I'd already made my plans. I was going to leave. We were just about a step away from divorce. And someone invited us to a Bible study on, of all things, marriage. Now, if it had been the Trinity, uh-uh. We wouldn't have done that. We weren't interested, but it was on marriage, and we were having such a hard time, and we thought, well, this is our last chance. We're going to give this a try. So we went to the Bible study, and I'll never forget it. Ladies, I tell you, we walked into that home, and there was a difference. The people there were, it was as if we were walking into a bright light. That's all I can say. They loved us. I mean, they didn't know us, but they were so warm and gracious and friendly. But that wasn't what got us. You know what got us? The husbands and wives loved each other. Now, we had a lot of friends who were married, but we did not have married friends who treated each other like they were their best friends, who really honored each other. Instead, we were used to kind of giving hard jabs about men and making jokes about men, and I'm sure the men did it about us too. But it was an entirely different environment. And here were people who really loved each other. Well, we started that Bible study. We had a little workbook, and every week there would be a different teaching. And I don't know how many weeks we were into it, but the week came when submission was talked about. I wish you could have seen my face. I'm sitting there listening to this uh, man, teacher, great, wonderful Bible teacher, talking about how the Bible said that wives should submit to their husbands. I thought, that this is like, ridiculous, like no way am I going to buy into this. This is archaic. This is old fashioned. This is absolutely stupid. And by the way, doesn't he know that we women have fought for our rights and now we're finally free? And yet that week as I went home and I would open up the word of God, the word of God is so powerful. And I started to see a little bit different picture of marriage and that wives were really to submit to their husbands in all things. Little by little, of course, I believed strongly that it was the Holy Spirit just working in my heart. I began to see what God was talking about and why it was a good idea. The Greek word for submission is hupotasso, and that literally means that you are going to put yourself under the authority of another person. This is not something that somebody does to you. This is you choosing to put yourself under their authority, to submit to their authority. And so I began to see that this did not mean that I was inferior in any way. The Bible says men and women are equal. We are equal in the sight of God. But there was another reason. I had been a teacher, and in that school I had a boss, my principal. And he would tell me what was the plan, and I would fit into the plan, and it never seemed to be a problem. I knew that in government there was always a boss. 
In fact, when I started really looking at society in whole, I began to see there's always got to be a leader. There always has to be someone who makes that final decision. Not that the leader comes and makes every decision in the world, but the leader has to make the final decision, and I began to see why that might be important. Later, I would read the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, it says seven times, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In other words, everyone wanted to be the boss, and everybody was just doing their thing. And if you want to see what chaos is, what misery is, you read the book of Judges, because that's exactly what happens. When there is no one there to make that final decision, there is going to be chaos. Another thing that really made me start thinking was when I began to see that God, the triune God, is three in one, that Jesus literally submitted to God. You know, it says that God sent his son. It doesn't say that his son said, golly, can I please go to earth and be crucified? I just can't wait. It didn't say that at all. It says God sent the son. And it also goes on to say that that the son did the will of the father. He was living in obedience. And ladies, you know what? He lived in obedience right to the cross. Then Jesus says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit would submit to Jesus. Now, was one inferior over the other? Absolutely not. They all were equal. They were all God. But what? Each one of them had a specific role. And that role was very important. And yes, there was submission in the Godhead. When we open the word, you know, we keep going back to those first three chapters in Genesis because they're so important. We find that God really did have a plan. It says in Genesis 1 that God created man and woman, and he created them in his own image. We talked about that last week. They're absolutely equal, both made in the image of God, both given the job to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Okay, then in chapter 2, where he gives more detail, just the same scriptures we went over last week, it says that he looked at man, and it was not good. Why? Man was alone. And so he made him a helper suitable. He formed woman to fit with man, to come alongside of him, to help him in this huge responsibility of subduing the earth. And so woman was given a distinct role. You know what? That role was given to her before the fall. That wasn't punishment. It wasn't oppression. It wasn't anything bad. It was something good. He made her for that purpose. When we talk about that word, a woman being a helper, that is exactly the same word that is used of God himself in Psalm 54. So if you start thinking that that's a demeaning word, it is not. I mean, if we can use that for God Almighty, certainly we should be proud to be able to carry that word, that role for us. And so then when Eve disobeyed God, remember, she disobeyed because she was going to take charge. Adam, who was supposed to be the leader, what did he do? He just stepped back and let her go. He became passive. And so between the two of them, they both disobeyed. They both stepped out of their role. They both ate the fruit. And because of that, now we have all the problems in the world. When God spoke to them after the fall, the woman was told that she would desire her husband, but he would be head over her. In other words, she would desire, she wants to control him. She wants to be the boss. And yet there's something in her heart that keeps longing for him. I think that, that, that women long for an intimacy with a man. They want to be, have that oneness, that unity. And yet his curse was that the ground would be difficult. It'd be hard to yield to. In other words, his work now is going to be a constant frustration and hard. I will tell you that was lived out in my marriage because I truly took charge and my husband kept stepping back away and away from the home until he was so focused on his work that his work became his mistress. I can't say strong enough the misery that brings a home. 
because neither one of you are satisfied. Neither one of you have what God wants you to have in that marriage. And so God had a plan, of course. <laughs> we ruined it, and now we have a lot of trouble. When we open Scripture, Scripture always is trying to lead us back to a better life. As I said last week, every time God says, do uh, he, it's for your good. Every time he says, don't do it, it's for your good. He's trying to give you the best life here on earth in a fallen world. And when we open scripture, God will say it not once. It's not some little obscure scripture stuck off in some book that, you know, we just don't give much attention to. God says over and over and over in four different books, in Ephesians, in the Colossians, in 1 Peter, in Titus, he says, wives, submit to your husbands. This is not women submitting to men. I don't need to submit to my neighbor. I only need to submit to my husband. But it will also go on to say, in the Lord. In other words, you submit to your husband as to the Lord. We don't necessarily put all of our trust in our husband's decisions. We put our trust in God. That's who we trust. So God is the one who is our protector. He is our provider. He is the one we look to as we submit to our husbands, as the church submits to Christ. So we are to submit to our husbands, but always our eyes are on the Lord. And that, for that reason, we do not have to be fearful. We do not have to be anxious. We keep our eyes on Christ as we submit. Well, after that Bible study, I began to embrace that whole idea of submission into my own life. And things went along very well. They go along very well when you're agreeing. And quite truthfully, Beloved and I agree on about 98% of everything. But the day came when I began to feel not good about my daughter being in public school. She was getting ready to go into the eighth grade. Uh, my friends all sent their kids to private school or else they homeschooled them and would always tell me how, uh, how wonderful it was. And so I began to think that her entire salvation revolved around her getting out of public school and going to a private school. And so I took it upon myself to look at all the private schools in the area, and I found one that was really, really, really good. I mean, they just did everything that I thought that I wanted for my daughter. And so I talked to Beloved about it, and I told him what, how great it was. I gave him a brochure, and I, I said, you know, I really think that uh, this would be so good for her, and it would keep her from evil, and I think that it would absolutely preserve her soul for heaven. And he read it over, and then he got to the price tag, and he said, uh, babe, we can't afford this. I just don't feel like at this time we can afford this. And I knew that we had savings and I knew how much we made and I had figured out a way that we could afford it. Well, he was pretty strong that we weren't. So I decided the next step would be to take him on a tour. So I arranged for us to have a tour of the school and we got there and we had a wonderful tour guide and she just played it up beautifully. And as I'm walking along, I'm thinking, he's going to love this. He's going to get get it, you know? He's going to agree with me. We ended the tour. We went out into the car. What did you think? He said, I think it's just fabulous. He said, but honey, we cannot afford it. Well, I was very mad. And so I said, okay, well, now you have to bring in the big gun, see? And so now I bring in spirituality. Honey, have you prayed about this? He said, no, I really haven't. Well, have you sought wise counsel? No, I haven't. Well, I think you need to do that. So why don't you pray about it for a week and seek wise counsel, and then on Saturday, let's go out for breakfast, and you can tell me what you've decided. So the week went by, and I'm praying, just begging God to change his mind, and we go out for breakfast, and I said, so what did you decide? And he said, I decided that we cannot afford it. She cannot go there this year. Honey, she, he said, it would just put a strain on our finances. She cannot afford it. And I will tell you, ladies, and I'm ashamed to tell you this, I was so angry because I really thought he did not care about our daughter. I thought he was not being wise. He was being unspiritual. Well, a week later, I'm reading the Bible, and I come across, once again, God saying, Pat, I really do want you to submit. 
I want you to trust me for your daughter, and I want you to submit and give up the idea of private school. And you know what? I truly felt like God was speaking right to my heart, and I just gave it up. And I said, Lord, I, I will submit, and I will change this rotten attitude, and I will go with your program. I don't understand it, but I'm going with your program. Well, she went to public school for the eighth grade. And I have to tell you, ladies, it was the best year for her. And God just poured his blessings on her. She was the light in that school that year in a remarkable way. She received awards. She received accolades. It built her confidence. And she came out of that, that eighth grade just really a blessed child. And you know what I learned? I learned a huge lesson. I learned that even though I can be absolutely assured that I am right, sometimes I'm not. And God is the all-wise one. Though I would like to think that I am, no, I am not. It is God. So when we look at this whole issue of submission, I want to share a few thoughts with you that I think are, are really important. First of all, and I, I think I've made this pretty clear, you trust God. You trust God and you live in obedience to him. But submission does not mean that you're a doormat. Remember that word helper? Adam needed a helper. And I truly think you are in the wrong if you do not share your thoughts. If you come to something that you both disagree on, you don't sit quietly and just say, oh, I have to submit. It is your role to be a helper to share your thoughts and ideas. You have a brain. And you, are, you have insights that sometimes our men don't have. You bring something very valuable to the table. And so you need to share those thoughts. If he makes a decision, he is responsible for his decision. When we stand before the Lord, I do not stand with beloved. We do not stand as a married couple. I stand all by myself. And what I need to answer to God is, have you been obedient to me, Pat? And I need to be able to say, yes, Lord, I have. Now, if a wrong decision is made, we stand alone on our decisions. So you're not responsible for your husband's decisions. I think it's hugely important to learn how to use the tone of your voice and the words that you use. It says, speak the truth in love. God's dead serious about that. And you know, Linda talked about how her, she would have an attitude. We all can do that. We can say what we think is just fine, but have that little edge, that little uh, disrespect in it. I think it's hugely important as we submit, we learn how to speak with words of tenderness and kindness and great respect and love. Because you know what? You can hear those words. Those harsh words, it's hard to hear. It just, it ma just makes one mad. But when you become an expert in speaking the truth in love and speaking wisdom, you will be heard. And I want to throw something else out. Are you trustworthy? Are you a trustworthy woman? Does your husband trust you and does he have a right to trust you? I was visiting a, a, an acquaintance years ago and she brought out a whole lot of clothes that she had just bought. They were gorgeous. They were very expensive and I was coveting and looking at them. And, <laughs> and when we got done, she said, now, now don't tell my husband. He doesn't know I bought these. You know what I thought? You're a deceiver. You're a liar. You can't be trusted. We don't do things behind our husband's back. Proverbs 31, her husband trusts in her. And ladies, I think that's hugely important. We have to be women that our husbands can 100% trust. Now, I told you the story about when I was dead wrong. Well, you know what? Every now and then, we are right. There were some financial decisions that needed to be made. I had very strong feelings about those financial decisions. My beloved had other ideas. And even though I truly laid out my ideas, I thought with a, uh, a quiet and gentle spirit, I laid them out repeatedly, um, he felt otherwise. And he made those decisions. And I will tell you that we lost everything. 
I was 60 years old and now we had no financial security and I was very afraid. And I remember the day came, I was truly just crying out to the Lord, just crying out to the Lord. All I could see is that I was going to end up being a very old bag lady. And there I was just really seeking the Lord. And I sensed that he said to me clearly, Pat, I will take care of you. I am your provider. I am your protector. My first thought was, yes, but will I have enough to color my hair? But I just let that one go. Do you know what? Over the next few months, the two of us stood together and we watched God do miracles. We look back on that time now, and I must admit, we will both say it was the hardest time, it was the best time, because we saw God work in ways that we would never have seen Him otherwise, ever. And it was marvelous sight. It was a marvelous sight. And I will tell you, it taught us the most, uh, the greatest lesson that we could learn, and that is God is faithful. He can be trusted. He truly is our provider. He is our provider, and He is our protector, and He is your provider, and He is your protector. So you see, sometimes you're going to be right, and sometimes you're going to be wrong because none of us are always all wise. So what are the benefits of submission? Well, you may find this a little funny, but quite truthfully, it's freedom. It's freedom. I don't have to be burdened with making every decision in the world. And there are times when I'm, I'm confused and I'm not really sure the right thing to do. And I'm, I'm trying to, Lord, what do you think I should do? And I can go to my husband and I can ask him to tell me what the right answer is or the right direction to go. And you know what? What he says is what I do. Because I believe whether it's right or wrong, God's got something in that answer for me. It might not turn out all rosy, but in the not so rosiness, I'm going to learn something that's going to be important. So I think it gives us tremendous freedom. I think it gives us safety. I think it gives us the opportunity to be able to be obedient to God, even when I, we aren't, really aren't sure exactly what's going to happen here. It gives us an opportunity to truly live in faithfulness before a holy God. Now, you and I both know that there are some tremendous distortions in this whole idea of submission. We have sometimes men who are so dominating and so harsh and they have to make every single decision in the world and they have a distorted view of submission and it is not a pleasant sight. On the other hand, we have pictures of women who have grasped on to the negative aspects of feminism who are so demanding of their way and they want to be right and they oppress men. So, Truly, we're always working with a world full of sinners here. There's also men who are so passive and they won't make a decision. They simply will step out and just whatever you want to do. And I will tell you, I think because of so much of the negative feminism, we are seeing more and more men unwilling to take their roles as strong leaders in the home. That's right where we were. I'm very choleric. I've got some sanguine in me. I want to take charge. I like to have a dinner party for 100. My husband is uh, melancholy, phlegmatic. His idea of a huge party is one couple over. So you see, we're very different. <laughs> we uh, are the exact opposite of each other, and yet God has put us together so that we can work together in such harmony. But what happened in our marriage was I was taking control. I was the leader, and it was a burden. And my husband stepped back. And I will tell you, we had to stop and rechange everything. I had to stop making every decision. And those decisions that affected us, our whole family, that were leadership decisions, I needed to stop and say, I'm not making this decision. You have to make this decision. And he had to step up to the plate and say, you're right, it's my job. I will make this decision. So it took us a while to kind of get the idea of how we were to live together. So what did we gain from it? I will tell you, we gained an intimacy that I only dreamed about. I would never have believed that we would have attained the oneness that God has given us now. And I would not go back for anything. I think Beloved feels that he is the leader and he likes that role. He knows I respect him. He knows I will follow him to the ends of the earth. He is very confident in that. But you know what? 
I feel very confident that he works hard to make wise decisions. Will he always make a wise decision? No, but I know he wants to, and that is enough for me. And so we really have been given a great gift from God. There are two things a woman never should submit to, and I want to make this absolutely clear. You should never, ever submit to physical abuse. Never. If you are in a situation where you are being physically abused, you leave. Now, God says he hates divorce, but you can get out of that situation. You don't stay in a dangerous situation for you or your children. You get out, you find safety, and you get help. And if you go to a counselor who tells you you should stay in a physically abusive situation, find yourself another counselor. You do not stay any place where you are being physically abused. Secondly, you do not agree to sin. Honey, I want you to sit here and watch these porn movies with me. No, no, I can't do that. Because there is a higher law, and that is the law of God. And so I obey God first. So I do not do anything that he would tell me I cannot do. I don't sign a tax thing that's cheating or deceiving that I know is a lie. I'm not going to partake in anything that is a direct command of God. And so you do not sin and you do not stay in an abusive situation. One more thing about submission. There may come a time, ladies, where you have to be the leader. A dear friend of mine's husband sank into a very deep depression. Could he be the leader? No. Can he help himself? He could not. She needed to take leadership to get him the help that he needed. If you have a porn addiction, if you have a drug addiction, if you have an alcohol addiction, that man needs help. You're the helper. And it's time that you have to step up and be uh, firm and do what you need to do to get the help that he needs. So sometimes, whether it's addiction or illness, a friend had cancer, uh, he his physical health was deteriorating, his little wife had to step up and be the leader. God has given us a submission as a good thing and not a bad thing. It's not about slavery. It's about not about oppression, but it is about unity and intimacy and spiritual growth and deepening love relationship between the two of you. And an amazing woman really does know what submission is and does it gladly for her Lord. Growing up, my parents gave me a great example of a godly marriage, and we attended a wonderful Bible church that gave me a solid grounding in God's Word. When I was a junior at Auburn University, Jay proposed to me, and we immediately started going to marriage counseling. When the subject of submission came up, I pretty much tuned out as I thought that I had the submission thing down. Growing up, it was so easy to obey my parents and do as they asked, so I thought that when I was married, it would not be different at all. Our family pastor performed the marriage ceremony, and in it, he gave me this challenge. Cameron, he said, the verse that I've chosen for you is Ephesians 4:15. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. He continued, now I know that you'll speak the truth and you'll speak it in love, but your greatest challenge will be to speak. As my new husband and I started out in our marriage, I realized that marriage and submission were much harder than I had imagined it would be. You see, I was sensitive, but easygoing person and pleasing others was my ultimate goal. So my first few years of marriage went something like this. My husband would do something that made me mad, like leaving clothes on the floor. I'd stuff it deep down, be annoyed, and then the next time he did something to frustrate me, I would pile it on top of my previous frustration and keep quiet. After about six months of frustrations, he would do one more small thing and I would blow up. One day in our third year of marriage, Jay did something that had made me angry and unhappy. So I remember I went to my room and moped and stuffed the anger when I happened to look up and see the verse from my wedding day hanging on the wall. And at that moment, I realized what my pastor had been saying to me. I was afraid to speak. It surprises me even now that he knew my weakness so much better than I knew myself. I wasn't supposed to be silent and just follow. I was to be a helper, and I could and should speak. This was my first step towards learning that submission does not mean that I cannot think for myself or have an opinion. Rather, in fact, my husband likes for me to tell him my thoughts about our decisions, what makes me happy, and what makes me angry. Several years passed, we finished seminary, Jay took a position as a youth pastor, and I really settled into my role as a pastor's wife and coasted along. We started taking our youth group to Eastern Europe to help run English summer camps. 
It was such an amazing experience for both of us and we started considering joining a missions organization and working full time with the youth in Eastern Europe. We were made aware of a huge need for missionaries in a far more difficult venue than what I was anticipating. My husband was ready to sign up immediately. I was much more fearful. So one day, as we were discussing this opportunity, I was now exercising my great ability to share my opinion. I was afraid of this unknown territory. What would happen to my small children? What about medical care? What about schooling? My husband stopped me while I was in mid-sentence and said, Cameron, we are only as strong as our weakest link. This was a test of my submission. My husband felt as though the Lord was calling our family to serve as missionaries there, and I really felt called too, just not to this place. As I prayed about it, God brought Jay's words to mind as a challenge rather than as a threat. I was being asked to trust ultimately in God, but also in my husband and his leadership. We moved overseas April 25th, 2005. I must admit it was a tremendously challenging experience for me as well as for my family. But God used my husband's challenge to shape my life in ways that I could never have imagined. And now, whenever God presents an opportunity to me, I often remember Jay's challenge and think, I don't want to be the link that keeps me, my husband, or my family from doing the Lord's will. I am reminded that Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 